Hi, my name is Max Gagliardi, and this is the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, take a moment to hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow us on your favorite podcast app. And for those of you that have been consistently liking and sharing and commenting on the episodes, I appreciate you. And I'm working on some things like some merch here coming soon, and I'm going to hook some of you guys up. I know who you are. I see that you're consistently engaging. It means a lot. So just want to say thanks. This episode's guest is Marty Bent, the editor-in-chief of the popular daily Bitcoin newsletter, Marty's Bent and the host of the Tales from the Crypt podcast. Marty is also the director of business development for Great American Mining, where his company is taking fugitive gas emissions and turning them into digital wealth. Marty is a trusted voice in the Bitcoin community, and his company is on the cutting edge of what they call the future era of the digital midstream. This episode is filled with discussions around the fundamentals of Bitcoin mining, energy consumptions, and the considerations around mining operations and how Bitcoin mining has the potential to be one of the cleanest use cases for energy consumption. Hope you enjoy the show. Well, Marty, welcome to to Talk Energy. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's exciting. We we did one the other day on Gamcast, and I had fun doing it. And then uh, there was a bunch of stuff kind of afterwards. I was like, man, we could have talked about this or, you know, like anything with the oil and gas and the Bitcoin. It just feels like I can talk about it quite a bit. So I'm glad to get you on and glad you agreed to come on. But first, I just want to talk before we get into I got kind of a loose agenda here, but I kind of want to talk first just a little bit about Marty Bent. I mean, man, you're I'm just going to say you're crushing it. You're doing all kinds of good stuff. You've got a cool background. You did the the, the newsletter, which people know about. Then you did uh, Barstool Sports, which is you know, pretty, uh, pretty popular in the media space. You've got the podcast. You're now, you're doing what you're doing at GAM, which is exciting. And I think kind of cutting edge in the Bitcoin mining world. And now you're an energy content creator as well, which I think that the energy side is, uh, is a little bit more in its infancy than some of these other industries, but you've completely, uh, ripped that wide open also, and are now having like pretty cool guests on your show and you're totally in the energy content creation world. So just how do you do it, man? <laughs> one day at a time one foot in front of the other no, i mean i got i'm just infinitely curious about um everything uh, particularly markets uh bitcoin obviously i'm very curious about that very passionate about it uh, and actually before barstool before i really fell down the bitcoin rabbit hole or any of that i worked at a managed futures fund um, and we basically index commodity trading advisors uh, into a fund of funds and I was an analyst there. And so the nature of that job was I had to follow commodities markets pretty, pretty closely for, for about three years. And so um, started out diving into Bitcoin because I noticed that the Fed and the other central banks around the world really didn't understand what they were doing or the impact their policies were having on the market overall. Um, and Bitcoin juxtaposed against all the central bank movements just really drew me in and filled on that rabbit hole. But also I was there as um, following crude markets globally as well. Um, so this foray back into the oil and gas markets via content for, for Great American Mining, actually um, something that's uh, bringing, bringing back the worries and going full circle to, to what I started out my career, I guess you can call this what this is that I'm doing. Yeah. How did you, with the newsletter, what was like the genesis of that? And I mean, it's a, it's five days a week. Is that how much you do it? Five days a week. That's a huge commitment. Six days actually. The, uh, the sat standard on Saturdays. Uh, so it actually started, I was unemployed for a year and a half. I, uh, I left the hedge fund space. I got tired of crunching Excel uh, Excel sheets day in and day out doing the same monotonous thing. I was pretty jaded by uh, the financial system, the central banking system. I mean, I was a senior in high school when 08 happened, and I actually, actually just happened to be taking like an elective economics class in the fall of 08. We went heavily into the TARP bill and all that. So I, I went to college to study economics at DePaul University in Chicago with like a know your enemy type mindset. It's like, how the hell did I get this bad? Right. And then like well, got further into the finance world, this hedge fund, uh, this managed futures fund to be more particular. Uh, I mean, I was talking to all the chief investment officers of the CTAs we are investing in and they didn't seem to know what was going on either. So they really jaded me. So I left and went to go study software and UX and UI design 
uh, and wound up moving to New York from Chicago and took a job as a software salesman selling offshore uh, software services. We had, we had a, a team of developers spread out between Quito, Ecuador and Cartagena, Colombia that specialized in Drupal CMS development. And I sold nice. that to uh, large media companies for, for a couple of years. That too got boring. I thought I was going to be able to parlay that into a product manager job. I thought I knew a lot about design and UX and the project management that goes into coordinating between development teams and designers. And so I quit that thinking I was quickly going to get a job and uh, I wound up being unemployed for about a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, the whole, the whole time and living in New York with my now wife I actually got married when I was unemployed. So she, she bought Marty's stock very low Yeah, at, the, at its lowest point. But isn't it weird how these that. things turn out? Like you, the thing about the being unemployed, like I lost a job and it helped me get into what I'm doing now. And I, you know, at the time you're kind of like, what's going to happen. But then in these weird paths in life, these forks and you look back at it and it's like, well, I think it turned out, turned out positive, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Especially in your twenties. Right. I was unemployed. I quit that job in 2016. <laughs> I got my job at Barstool in late 2017. Yeah. So it was like a year and a half. I was 24, 25. And so that, if you're going to make that that unemployment gap, I think that's a good time to do it and explore yourself. The whole time I was still extremely passionate about Bitcoin, following it, learning as much as I could, trying to stack as many stats as possible. But as you can imagine it's pretty hard when you're unemployed. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so the impetus for the newsletter was I just uh, failed at getting a dog walking job. I couldn't put a leash on correctly. Uh, at, uh, that's a fake story. This, this interview. And no, I swear to God, it's <laughs> the lowest point of my life. I cried like I'm not trying to laugh. Like, I'm what sorry. The fuck are you, are you even doing with your life? Um, and then my, yeah, my 26th birthday, my dad, my parents were up in Brooklyn where I was living at the time. My dad, knowing because at the managed futures fund that I work for, I wrote all of our commentaries, like our weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly commentaries, and we just hand it over to the portfolio manager. He'd be like, "Yep, this is our commentary." Uh, and he was like, yeah, you can write like, and at the same time as when the Bitcoin price was going up and I had all my family and friends texting me because they knew I was like so into Bitcoin. They're like, what the hell's going on? He's like, you should start a newsletter. So it's actually my dad um, after a long bout of unemployment and knowing I was passionate about Bitcoin, it could write, could put string some words together that, that made sense to people. He said, you should start a newsletter. I was like, you know what, dad, I will do that. And so I started, it was like a list of 10 family and friends and uh, I'd send it out every day and started posting it on Twitter and it took on a life of its own. Uh, the guys at Barstool um, found it. Uh, well, one guy in particular who's not there anymore, but he found it. He brought me in and he convinced me to start Tales from the Crypt. He's like, people like the newsletter. Um, you should start a podcast. So it was like podcasting was pretty big at that point, but it's not as big as it is now. Yeah, you're so and early. Like, yeah, people need a Bitcoin podcast, so you should start one. And so, yeah, before I even officially worked at Barstool, I would go in and sneak into their studios uh, after hours when nobody was in the office and record the first episodes of Tales from the Crypt. That's awesome. I want to, a couple of things you said, it's interesting your dad telling you to do it. And when I was, I had a stretch where I was unemployed and uh, similar, my dad was just like, stop feeling, you know, he was like, don't feel sorry for yourself. He said, go make some, uh, go make some business cards and just start like going somewhere every day and like doing something. It's just cool. Dads, I feel like, uh, they've got kind of that wisdom to be like, you just need to do something. And, uh, that's half the battle sometimes, right? It's just like putting yourself out there and saying, Hey, look, you know, like when I first was doing what I'm doing it, well, I didn't have anything. It was just me, but I had like a company name and, you know, an idea of what I wanted to try to do. And, uh, but without taking those first steps and kind of being pushed, I would have still just been like putting my resume in to random, like online, you know, whatever, fill this thing out and send it in. So that's cool that, uh, your dad pushed you to do that. And, uh, he had some good vision there and it's, it's awesome that it's landed here and landed at Barstool. Um, and that's what I wanted to ask about next is how was it, what was it like working in Barstool? It's probably changed a lot since then, or maybe it hasn't, I don't know. What is it, what was it like working there then? And, and, uh, that's just a cool experience now that Barstool is kind of a big deal. Uh, it's a cool line on the resume. Yeah, the um, so we were in HQ two at the time, which was in Flatiron, like twentieth and 
28th, excuse me, and I forget the crossroad. I've been out of New York for a year and I already forget the streets. Yeah, I mean, it was, I was so, I was the quote unquote crypto guy, like a barstool, obviously a content juggernaut. Dave Portnoy and crew know how to lean into things uh, when they're hot. And I just got lucky to a certain extent that uh, the, the topic of cryptocurrency was hot in the fall and winter of 2017 when it was going on that bull run. I actually <laughs> I got brought in as like an ad sales uh, guy. I mean, I, I, that's what I did. I sold podcast ads and like Instagram swipe up ads for uh, their various uh, media, their, their various podcasts and shows that they have across their platform. Uh, but I was also like the, the resident like crypto expert, quote unquote. And so all of them are jumping. For me in particular, it's funny getting this newsletter every day. And uh, honestly, like I've been a Barstool fan since I was in high school. I'm from Philadelphia, and I remember when Barstool Philly came out. Yeah. And reading article, those blogs back in like 2011, 2012. I was out of high school at that point, but in college, still following it and just laughing my ass out off. And like, uh, like the, the rawness of the content really is what drew me into Barstool originally. And, and, that, and actually, one thing Dave Portnoy. Um, talks about a lot is like he delivered papers every day. And that's actually something that drives me at the newsletter is like, hey, they Portnoy had to show up every day with a physical newspaper at the train station to get the barstool to where it is today. He did that for four years or something with no traction. Like Barstool's not an overnight success story. It took like a decade yeah. and a half, arguably, to get to where it is today. Um, so it's funny for me writing this newsletter like about Bitcoin only, and I was like very anti- altcoins because I think they're distracting and a bunch of people lose money and I go in I try to pitch that message to the barstool personalities and they just did not grok it at all they're like buying one chain <laughs> uh, ripple nano like all that so like during that 2017 uh, mania uh, <laughs> I was sort of in the middle of the office uh, being like stop buying all these shit coins are all gonna get wrecked Nobody listened to me. Um, a lot of people got wrecked. Yeah. I mean, nothing crazy, but uh, it was it was a fun time. And outside of like the cryptocurrency focus, I mean, it's a very well run business. Eric and um is whipping those guys into shape. So we were in headquarters too, which I like, think it was a little bit more uh, rough around the edges. Now they're in a huge headquarters. I was actually in their offices in January of this year talking about Bitcoin. Uh, make, made my reunion uh, trip to to the new HQ. It's completely different than HQ to um, they're they're more they're like a legitimate media company now. Yeah, where they were more scrappy when I was working there, and I only worked there for like six or seven months before I, I wound up leaving the pirate ship to to come join Great American Mining. Gotcha. Yeah, and I want to get into actual energy and uh, oil and gas and stuff too, but this is just fun for me to talk about. But before we move on to that, what's it like just, uh, you know, you've been creating content for a while now. I'm very new uh, to the content world. That's why it's really fun to talk to somebody like you on the show. And, uh, and I've talked to one other, what I would call kind of professional content creator, but it's just cool uh, to hear your experience, but then also just what's it like? I mean, I think it's obviously it's steamrolled for you. It's picked up for you, you know, uh, I mean, being at Barstool and having the newsletter early on is not insignificant at all. You were already doing good things, but now, I mean, very popular show. Uh, you've now got another show. I mean, what's it, is it like, what I'll just tell you my, you know, experience so far is that it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot more work, I think probably in some ways than I thought it would be. And just like time goes by so quick and it's like every week having to put out, you know, whether that's one new piece or for example, now I think you're doing like two, uh, Two podcasts. You've got the the newsletter, or maybe even more. How many are you releasing now a week? And and just in general, what is it? Uh, what's it like? Is it everything you've uh, you wanted it to be, or is it in different in ways? Or uh, just just give me some insight here into what it's like being a content creator. Yeah, it's crazy. We're going to release five podcast episodes this week between Gamcast and Tales from the Crypt. Um, I mean, it's, I didn't envision any of this. I, I, it's like it happened all organically. Like again, my dad was just like, "Hey, start writing about something." Like you can write. And I started writing about something. People started noticing. People wanted more. So my content journey has just been going to where the audience 
is taking me, right? Like it started as a newsletter and then Lewis, the guy who brought me into Barstool was like, you should make a podcast and the freaks as we call them at the TFTC media brand, whatever the hell it is, um, they agreed and they wanted some audio content. So I was like, all right, I'll give it to you. Uh, and we've developed, so it started out as an interview series and then uh, organically we, we added a, a day or excuse me, a weekly new show of everything that's going on in Bitcoin with rabbit hole recap. My co-host Matt Odell, I reached out to him, knew he was living in New York and knew that he knew his shit and was like, Hey, we should do a weekly new show. We can meet up and do it. And so we've been doing that almost three years straight, two and a half years. Um, it'll be three years in the end of August, beginning of September. Uh, and then yeah, I think it's just going to where it's all muscle memory for me at this point. Like I, the newsletter, especially, uh, like I, I know process down where I just get a topic and it's like, all right, you have to write about this over the course of the next one to three hours, like get it out. Yeah. It does take time, but that's what you'll find out. Like delivering papers every day, you develop this muscle memory and this case, um, like I still, like, that's why the audio quality suffers and the, the editing suffers is I, I still do all that. That's crazy that. that you do all the editing. That's just yeah. doesn't seem like you're, you're the talent, Marty. You don't need to be, I mean, like you don't need to be, you could do, we could get on Upwork or something and they'll do it for like five bucks an episode or something, 10 bucks an episode. Yeah. You can stack as many sats though for paying people. Yeah. So that $5 yeah. is going to be worth so much in, uh, in sats yeah, one day. It's yeah, funny. You think, you think that's crazy, but like I was, again, being that, that Bitcoin friend and family member, like in 26, I had a buddy, my buddy, Tim texted me like two weeks ago. And like when I, like that was my thing when I was like 20, 23, 24, like out at the bars, it's so stupid looking back on it, but whatever it happened, I'd be that friend, like trying to get my other friends in the Bitcoin. Like you guys got to fucking focus on this. Like it's going to change the world. And I'd be like, download the Coinbase app. This was like back when I was using Coinbase and it was the only game in town. And I'd make them download the Coinbase app and then I'd send them $5 or to $20 worth of Bitcoin. And my buddy Tim texted me two weeks ago. I was like, remember that $15 you sent me in February of 2016? I was like, nope. He was like, that's worth $1,800 now. That's like, crazy. Holy shit. He's like, that's I need a steak dinner. So, that's great. So you think this, this $5 Upwork producer yeah. payments, they add up over time. Yeah, but if you can collect more sats, though, from scaling your stuff and getting more opportunities, uh, I don't know. I just, I've been trying to like just having, you know, companies and it's a struggle. And I think for me, scaling is probably one of the hardest things to think about when you have a company and whether that's a media thing like this or whether it's, you know, what we do in COVID, but it's like, it's some level along the path of scaling. You have to like, let these things go and like get comfortable with it. And then like have the people that you trust in, uh, to do the things. And it's like, but it's leverage though. Right. I mean, like, it's kind of like you're leveraging that to, uh, to get into other stuff. So with the content stuff, I mean, I tried like right out the gate to just edit it like my first episode and it took me forever. I was like, just like editing it and <clears throat> I'm doing the video thing. I'm doing video and audio, which I just kind of committed to early on, even though a lot of people were like, don't do it. It's way too much work. And, uh, and I just was like, well, I'm already doing the audio. I might as well just capture the video and put it out there. And I'd like never even talked on video ever before doing the podcast. I'd just never done anything. I would played some music before when I was younger and like we'd recorded stuff, but never had spoke on it. And so just kind of did it and then quickly er, like realized like this is way too much work. And so I have some guys, RGB studios, they help me out and they're, they're good guys, guys I've known since I was in college. And, uh, I just, for me, it's, I need to get a sponsor at some point when I'm still so early on. Like most people I talk to are like, dude, two years, you just need to like stack up episodes and, uh, but it would be cool to be able to like cover some of that cost, but it's kind of like for now, my time, I just sort of value it to the point where I'm like, I just got to pay these guys to help me out and they're reasonable. So oh, video will help you out there because YouTube, if they're not censoring you. Yeah, dude, it's, it's weird. It'd be pretty lucrative if, if, uh, if your videos get enough, um, get enough traction. There's ways to game the SEO. I look like shit right now and I typically look like shit. So that's why I don't do audio. It may, uh, it's a whole yeah. nother thing. You have to like, you don't have to, but you, you know, you're kind of like, Oh, I have to like take a shower and like put on a, you know, you just like, it's just a whole nother layer to like 
thinking about the content, right? Because you're just like immortalizing it. Uh, but no, I mean like you, the thing about YouTube th- censorship real quick, it's weird. Like I've been getting flagged with like, uh, even warnings on my videos and I'm not talking about anything controversial. Like we talked about like, uh, like COVID and as it relates to oil demand, I'm probably going to get hit with another one for just saying the word COVID. But, and then in the other one, the last episode we just released, we just, I don't, we didn't talk about anything that was, and it flagged it and said, uh, sensitive, like U S elections, something about elections. I don't know. Like we didn't even talk about anything about the elections and it was like not suitable for advertisers may not be seen by all viewers or something weird. Like, I don't know. I don't. And then now when I go on there, it doesn't show that. So I don't know if it just like, it's weird, man. Like, I don't know what the bot, I guess it's gotta be bots, right? It's not like real people. Yeah, it's mainly algo driven. Yeah. But free speech on these platforms is dying, man. They're, they're stomping it out. Yeah. You can't have, you can't have any wrong thought uh, in the, in the eyes of the establishment especially on YouTube. Yeah. Twitter's another bull. They're kicking off people with bad thought. It's weird because it's like, but is it like capitalist driven too? I mean, I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's ideology and it's, they only want certain things and certain other things. And I agree with that, but it's also like, they just want to make money and they're like, yeah, you said something I didn't like. Advertisers don't like that. So too, it's kind of like, the other side, I mean, is advertising. Yeah. You have to kick somebody off the platform. That's true. But again, like in the Bitcoin space, a lot of staunch libertarians, they'll say tough luck, like go build something else, like go build right. Gab. Um, if you don't like it, it's private property. Right. I mean, the companies get to dictate what happens on their platforms at the end of the day. They have amassed a, a significant network effect, which. Right hard to uh, stomach the fact that you can just be censored in mass. Yeah. The difference is though, is that like, it's not, it's not, uh, but they're protected by federal law though. That's the problem is that they're protected against, uh, being sued. So they have these like broad federal protections that are really like governmental protections, yet they don't have to, uh, adhere to the first amendment. So I get the liberty cause I'm, you know, lean libertarian, but And so I made that argument for a long time. But then when you really look at what these guys, this like preferred structure, that was it section 230, 280, 230. 230. Yeah. So section 230, it's like, yeah, they're companies and yeah, it's their private property, but they're being protected by the federal government in ways that nobody else gets. Right. So they, but then they're not also adhering to the first amendment. So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem that we live in. I don't know that it's ever going to get solved, to be honest, until somebody else just builds other, other platforms. Bitcoin fixes this. Oh yeah. Fixes it's people fuck you money to go build fuck you platforms. It's already happening. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. So getting into the, so we talked about the content stuff. What about gam? Like how did that, what was the genesis there? And then a little bit more about the company in terms of your guys is, you know, I know what you're doing now with the flare gas, but what was the, what was the initial thesis? Is it still the same? Did you guys look at pirating other different, you know, you guys call yourself energy pirates. Like what were the different, uh, angles that you've evaluated uh, prior to getting to the flare stuff, and how did you get involved with the guys? So again, this is the power of content. If people like your content; it could lead to opportunities. So right. Tom, who we've been talking about, or no, we talked about that before we hit record. But Tom is our operations officer. He found the newsletter and then a podcast. It's funny because uh, Todd, our CEO, shared the screenshots of the. The conversation Tom had with Todd in February 2018, uh, being like, hey, we should bring this Marty guy on. And so uh, they found me via the podcast and the newsletter, and they reached out. So Great American Mining spun out of an ad tech company called Buy Sell Ads. So our CEO, Todd, bootstrapped this this ad tech company in like 2008 or 2009, I believe. Uh, and he's running this small private business for... Uh, a period of time again, like it was profitable from day one. He created a platform where publishers and advertisers can meet to to sell ad and buy ad space. Uh, very lucrative business. Started that business at a very good time when when content on the internet was blowing up and ever there's a lot of advertising dollars to be made. And just the nature of that business, <clears throat> getting introduced and interacting with all these publishers uh, in 2013, 2014, he got approached by publishers that were focused on Bitcoin content and data and started working with them. At one point, actually, funnily enough, somebody who is uh, much maligned in the Bitcoin space, uh, Roger Rare, who owns Bitcoin.com, which is a website mm. you should not go to about Bitcoin, 
Uh, Noted. It's propagandized for a first <laughs> chain that is not Bitcoin, but that's a whole other story. Uh, he approached Todd and said, hey, if you want to sell ads on Bitcoin.com, Bitcoin on our behalf, and we're only going to accept Bitcoin as payment. And also you have to hold the Bitcoin that you make as a profit on the ad sales. And Todd was like, fuck it. Like, okay. Um, and a bunch of other publishers in the Bitcoin space and, uh, so Todd basically built a white label service that allowed all these publishers to accept Bitcoin for, for advertising payments and decided to hold Bitcoin profits that BSA made from these ad sales. And just naturally, what happens when you hold Bitcoin for long enough, you, you go through one of these price increases. And Todd looked at how much the Bitcoin on his balance sheet was yeah. worth. Uh, again, the like accumulation price was significantly lower than it is now. I was like, holy crap, this Bitcoin thing is like real. And he, um, obviously the nature of working with the publishers and being in, in with Bitcoin payments uh, to a certain extent, like learn more about it and developed enough confidence to believe in Bitcoin, saw the price appreciation uh, significantly. And he said, all right, like I want to contribute to Bitcoin. I want to build a business around Bitcoin stuff. Um, what we're doing at BSA and uh, he, I don't mistake because we're a successful business now, but uh, uh, he made a decision that many people make and, and aren't successful and follow him. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna mine Bitcoin. Like, let's just do that. Um, and so at the height of the bull market, like the end of 2017, yeah. he bought a bunch of drug <laughs> miners, which was a, a, a miner model that uh, was very hyped up, but did not. It was all hump and no red rocket. They, they delayed the, uh, the the release of the miners, and when finally got them, uh, uh, realized they weren't as efficient as the top of the line miners on the market at the time. On top of that, I mean, miner he got all these miners and like discovered uh, that you need to learn how to plug them in. Sure, and it's not cheap to plug them in. You need cheap energy, um, and so. Learned a hard lesson straight up, but it sent us down this path to find uh, a a cheap, reliable, scalable energy source to mine Bitcoin at a power production cost that is that is below the 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 average of of the rest of the mining industry. And so yeah, we oh gosh, we uh, we we were talking to like I think there was like a natural land up in New Hampshire. We got caught up with some guys in Utah who are bullshitting us for a little bit um, around, I for, even forget what the source of energy was there. We, we talked, we tried to negotiate power purchase agreements with grids in small towns at excess capacity. Um, and we were actually in the summer of 2019, spring, summer of 2019. Uh, like Todd like gave the team, there was like four of us at the time. I didn't even get the ultimatum, but like the engineers working on our solution, like Reet and Tom, Todd was like, all right, like we've come down this path pretty far. Uh, and, uh, I'm spending a lot of, cause Todd's bootstrapping all this, right. uh, this personal, uh, wallet and, and, and funding it with some of BSA profits as well. And he's like, all right, like we're dumping a lot of money into this. We have no scalable solution. Like he gave, he gave a six week ultimate. It was like, if it's six weeks, like we don't have a solution that, that makes sense. Like we're just going to pack it up and go home. And like destiny luck plays, plays into a lot of these success stories. Um, our head engineer Reet was at a state fair. I was talking to him. He got a background on gas industry and at the EPA. And he was talking to a buddy who owned a water treatment facility and um, a project out in Utah, somewhat exactly where I was like, hey, and Bree was telling him like, yeah, we're just looking for like cheap, scalable energy. And he was like, well, I have this gas and I'm just flaring at water treatment center. Like you want to come and just hook up a generator and, and use that to, to mine Bitcoin. He was like, yeah, well, we can. And so that's how we, fell into this this gas rabbit hole we just having a conversation at a fair we plugged in our first prototype uh it worked we were like holy crap this works and 
since then we've been iterating on our container design and and going up and, and engaging with producers to, to do offtake agreements and help them mitigate flare where we can throughout the Bakken and we're expanding into two other basins as well. So yeah. it's been been a crazy meandering ride. That's awesome. And I want to talk a bunch more about GAM and some of these things, but something you said that I want to touch on, because a lot of people have asked me kind of like uh, around the content stuff, kind of like, what is the, what's the goal here? I think it was a little odd for a lot of people that know me because I didn't have any social media really at all, like nothing other than just some non accounts. And people were just like, you know, it's going to be really hard to like make money doing content or like selling ads or whatever. And just like a lot of like anything, this is a common thing that I get anytime I've started a company or done something. Cause it's always just like a lot of people want to tell you all the negative things, right? Like why it's not going to work and uh, give you all this advice, like all these warnings. And I feel like with the content stuff, even, I mean, still, it's still happening. I'm only like 10 weeks in, uh, but people just kind of like looking at me sh and it's weird. Like they'll have a conversation with me, like someone I've known and they're sort of like, uh, and then at the end they'll bring up like the podcast thing. It's kind of like, they were feeling me out. Like, are you still the same guy? Like, what's your, like, what are you going down some weird path that like, and then are you okay, man? yeah, like, are you all right? Like, how are things going? And then they'll bring it up at the end of the conversation. It's like, oh, and by the way, like I saw that podcast thing. That's cool. Like, and it's always like, I haven't listened to it, but I will at some point. I'm like, yeah, man, cool. Like, it's just, it's a thing. But to what you said about it was, you know, you just never know. It's the networking. It's not like the, the views or the whatever. I mean, these other metrics, the monetary metrics, it's just like, like I ran in, I met you guys, I met you and Tom, like saw the podcast and he was like, Hey, like, let's talk about Bitcoin or something. Just like message me. And you know, I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have met you guys. And it's not just you guys. I mean, I feel like it's been this weird exponential networking effect, uh, that's happening. And so it's not really like translating into like even my wife still is like trying to figure out why it's powerful. Right. And she'll be like, you got like 15 views on your, uh, this thing you just did yesterday. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But those people, You're I wouldn't on the couch. And I... Yeah. I mean, like those are 15 people that I wouldn't have been able to connect with otherwise. And so it's just, I don't know. Like I see the power now and I saw it beforehand. My brother had started a podcast and he was just like preaching to me about it. He's like, dude, like you really, this is a big thing. Like you're going to, you're going to interact with a lot of people you wouldn't other, otherwise have interacted with and had conversations with. And so that's really cool that that was the genesis of, uh, of GAM and you getting involved with these guys. And then back to the story that you talked about around finding the cheap energy sources. How long ago was the, was that, what year did you say? Was that 18, 19 when you guys plugged into the gas? 2019, 2019. Okay. So fairly recently. Well, it's just an interesting play, um, because there is a lot of stranded gas and there's also a lot of cheap energy out there too. And I think that's where the oil and gas side of it and understanding, you know, what's going on in the oil and gas markets and specifically natural gas. And then this idea that you can, you know, and I've heard you, I think, talk about it maybe on your show, but this idea that prior to Bitcoin, uh, there was never like, you know, energy harvesting always had to be like proximity wise close to whatever the need was, you know, that was the main, the main, you know, challenge with any source of energy. And the game changer here with Bitcoin is that it really can be located kind of wherever you want. So it's more just this quest for like efficient and low cost energy. And it also like, because of that, you know, a lot of what I do is, um, transportation focused, right? I mean, it, it matters like where you're at, like how much money it takes to connect that source of energy into these other, you know, to get it to an end user or to a market. And so taking that paradigm kind of out of it. Uh, or at least you, you can kind of, I mean, some of these things like around using natural gas, it's nice if they're aggregated. So pipelines may be involved, but this idea that you can just like, you know, seek and find the lowest cost energy, you know, seek it out. And then you guys can create, you know, your model around it, I think is really interesting. And so I'm excited to see how it evolves with, uh, with GAM and what you guys are doing, but just for the people, I don't want to do a lot of Bitcoin one-on-one cause I think I'd like to talk about some more nuanced stuff, but just mining one hundred and one for people in the oil and gas space who might not know, uh, you know, exactly what it is or what it means. Uh, just, you know, don't want to spend too much time on the, on the, on the one one stuff, but just maybe a little bit of explanation. And then for my benefit too, after the one one maybe talk about kind of the history of mining. I think that's the part I don't know that much about. And I think it would be cool if you could walk me through just sort of the history of how this stuff has evolved. I know now there's like some big, you know, big market cap public companies. Like how did it get to this point? And then for the people that don't know, just kind of in general, what does it, what does it mean? Yeah. 
the uh I'm trying to keep it at a one on one level. I get yelled at by Tom a lot for for getting too technical with this stuff. So I've been working on my one on one pitch. Uh, so mining specifically, like Bitcoin, again, it's a first up, it's a it's a decentralized, distributed, peer to peer digital cash system. So it's decentralized uh, in the way blocks of transactions are added to the ledger, which just records who has what Bitcoin at what given point in time. It's recorded in called blocks. So right now we are, when Bitcoin started in January 3rd, 2009, we had the Genesis block. And then after that, you had block one and block two. And fast forward to today, uh, miners are currently building on block 673,909. So only 600,000 so something? What miners, 673,909 blocks have been produced on the Bitcoin network. And, and so um, do so you... Blocks of transactions. Yeah. And so in, when you talk about transactions, is it every time a Bitcoin is exchanged for anything? Is it every time a Bitcoin is exchanged between part or sats, I guess, because it can be fractional. So anytime there's like an exchange at all. And then, and then after that exchange happens, it has to what connect to the nodes or to be an official to get incorporated into the block. Just how does that work? Yeah. So if I wanted to send Bitcoin to you, basically I would construct a transaction. I'd say, Hey, I have these Bitcoin in my public addresses and this particular UTXO, it's called an unspent action output. That is an input in a new transaction. So these are actually what Bitcoin are. If I have a 0.1 Bitcoin UTXO and I want to send you 0.99 Bitcoin, I'm like, all right, I'm going to pick this UTXO. Give me an address that you possess, that you own, your public address. And I'm going to paste that that address into my wallet and say, hey, I'm going to take my Bitcoin from this this area of the ledger in this public address and I'm going to send it over to Max. And so what happened is I use... What is associated with that public address is called a private key that proves I own the Bitcoin. Um, so I sign my private key. I say, hey, Bitcoin, I'm sending it to Max's address. And then what happens is I, if you correctly and you run your own full node, you you use your own node to to action to the rest. But typically, most people use their wallets and they're they're using a web interface with that hardware wallet. That and that web interface is bad servers that are broadcasting it for you. So you broadcast a transaction. Say, Marty's send this Bitcoin to Max, and it propagates through the network. And the next, he has his private key matches that address. Like he can, he's releasing this Bitcoin and he's sending it to this address. And so the propagates action and the my uh, at the transactions as well, and saying, all right. I'm going to try and create the next block. So I'm going to, I'm going to gather these transactions, not all because there's, uh, limits on the amount of data that you can fit in each block. So there may be hundred thousand transactions, um, that are, people are trying to broadcast at any given point in time, but only about three to 4,000 can get fit in a block. So the miners are like, all right, I'm going to pick the. 1500 to 4,000 transactions and put them in a block, uh, to add to the ledger. And the way a miner is able to add a block to the ledger is they have to solve, they have to find a very specific puzzle piece. So, so these miners are basically looking for the golden snitch, if you will, like from Harry Potter at any given point in time. So the network has what's called a difficulty target, which says, Hey, at any given point in time, Here's the difficulty that the network dictates that you need to find a hash. Uh, so you, you need to find a hash below this difficulty target. Use a hash that is smaller than the current target. You prove that you, you did some work. You expended some electricity right. to produce this hash. And we know you did that because it's really hard to find this hash. Yeah. You're not just going to produce it out of your mind with no effort. And then, so any miner that finds a hash below the current difficulty target, they then say, all right, I found the hash below the difficulty target. Here's the transactions I want in the block. And they send that out to the network, call the nodes, say, all right, these transactions are, are able to be made. They're, they're within consensus rules. Uh, he's not printing any more Bitcoin. So like, all right, we're going to add this block to the ledger. And then the miners start building another block on top of that. 
and uh, miners get rewarded in Bitcoin. Uh, it's called the block reward, and it's made up of two parts. First part is the the block subsidy, which is predetermined in the protocol. Right now, it's six point two Bitcoin per block, and then they get the fees um, attached to their transactions that they that they put in the block. So that's what's happening. I hope that was one hundred and one. Okay. Well, I asked you. I asked you to do one on one, and then I asked you a technical kind of more technical question, which you did a good job explaining. But uh, I think let me just try to say it in my like. I'll just behave with this. I'll tell you what I think it is, or what I explain it to people when they ask me to try to dumb it down as much as I can. And I only understand it in a dumbed down version anyway, so that's all I can really say. And then you tell me how I'm mischaracterizing it or if I'm getting it wrong. Okay, so basically, uh, I would I kind of view it in my mind as sort of like. Uh, kind of almost like the internet except for it's money, right? It's, it's Bitcoin and you've got this network that the Bitcoin transactions run on and that network is underpinned and, and upheld through the miners and the miners are basically the platform that this network is running on and to incentivize the network to run and to do these calculate, it, you know, you have to show this proof of work and that's what, and there's an incentive structure that gives you then, uh, that pays you in Bitcoin and so there's this natural, almost uh, capitalistic, uh, you know, way to basically say that, you know, we're all going to decentralize, build this network. And unlike maybe an Amazon or somebody that runs the actual Internet where you've got these big server farms and it's a big company that builds them. This is just a bunch of different people that are doing it. And, uh, and they're doing it because, number one, they believe in it. And number two, it's capitalistic. They get incentivized to do it. And, uh, and that's all these miners really are, are just, uh, are the, it's like the internet. It's like a money internet. Is that like a dumbed down fair thing? Or did I get anything wrong that I mischaracterized things there? I have one nitpick. Okay. Is that, like, I want to say that miners are the platform per se. I would say that the consensus rules that the miners are playing within are the problem. Like you, you come to Bitcoin, you have to play. Right. This very specific game with very specific rules. And right. And that is the platform from which you're operating on top. And as long as you're rules as dictated by the platform, you can add blocks to the ledger. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, so miners act as uh, they're basically contract con to to add and facilitate trans to the ledger. And they are the that, that transactions are able to have at the end of the day. Um, they, and the energy to prove they did work to then add a block of transactions to the network to get rewarded in Bitcoin but to to get reward when they think the the rate at which they can produce Bitcoins will be better than the price of Bitcoin time gotcha so let me so I think that I think hopefully that's a good explanation for listeners and uh, and so what I would like to understand now it's, go ahead I was just gonna say like it, it, you're never going to go into like a podcast or a blog or um, especially if this is your first time on Bitcoin or try to understand it and that come out with complete or even full understanding. Sure. It takes the, it's so raw and so new of a technology. It takes time to truly understand, especially since it's a, it's a distributed system. Like it's not like you're, your web app or your Twitter or anything like that. Like the, the, the dynamics of how everything works is, is pretty different than anything you've probably interacted with up to this point in time. So like if that, like I would just call not caution, but like just a 101 explanation feeling like crazy or like what the hell did that dude just say? It's not an uncommon feeling to have when you're first getting exposed to Bitcoin going to take uh, a good amount of of effort and time spent learning about the intricacies of the network to actually understand it fully good way to start would be uh subscribing to your newsletter right marty's bent tftc.io you can there should be a pop-up that tells yeah. you to sign up and noise you yeah there you go Just take your email address nothing else <laughs> so, uh, history of mining, how's it evolved? Like where did it, where did it start? And then get, walk me through how we got to where these like public guys have these huge market caps and just, just kind of how it's, uh, you know, the cliff notes version, but how it got to where it is today. Yeah. So I mentioned the Genesis block, 
That was it. That was mined on January 3rd, 2009. Like, it's like, yeah. So, what are, it's simple. January 3rd, 2009. The Genesis block was mined, and then Satoshi actually waited for new participants to join the network before he allowed another mine or block to be mined. And so, uh, as soon as more people started joining the network and downloading the Bitcoin soft, hitting the mine button, more blocks started being produced. And uh, so, in the early days of Bitcoin, back in 2009, you could you could use a CPU. Uh, your your laptop, your desktop, whatever it be, to mine Bitcoin. You download the Bitcoin software, you hit mine, and it, w- it was very easy to find the the hashes below the difficulty target at that given point in time. The amount of computing to, to find those hashes was considerably, considerably less than it is today. Right. And as Bitcoin got more popular over time and more computing power came onto the network, um, this is actually the most pivotal part of Bitcoin and like the actually the the genius of what satoshi created revolves around the difficulty adjustment so i've been talking about the difficulty target that miners are trying to find a hash below what what sort of dictates that target at any given point in time is the difficulty adjustment, which happens every 2016 blocks so depending on how much computing power comes on to the network uh, in a 2016 period, the difficulty will adjust either up. So if um, if a lot of computing power comes on the network, and so what that does is when more computing power comes in, you have more people finding hashes, with, which are finding blocks at a quicker pace, faster than the 10-minute target that Satoshi put into the protocol. And so if more computing power comes on the network between the difficulty adjustments, uh, the network self calibrates says, Hey, there's more computing power. Blocks are coming in at less than 10 minutes. We need to make it to mine. Um, and the difficulty adjusts upwards, and it's now harder to find these hashes below the difficulty target. And so, over time, as Bitcoin developed a price, there's, this is the feedback loop that Bitcoin sort of initiated in the early days. Is, is it starts with the price as soon as somebody Bitcoin a price and people started buying it on the open market and exchanging it for goods that created an incentive for more and more miners to come on the network and so when the when you puts going up people with their computers back in the day cpus were like all right this thing has value if i just plug in my computer and start mining these hashes i can get these bitcoins and sell them hopefully for a profit and slowly over time as the price kept going up more and more people started adding more and more computing power to the network where the difficulty adjusts kept adjusting upward and upward to the point where it got so hard uh, to mine Bitcoin that you had to transition to do mining. Uh, so graphics processor units, um, gaming computers, that, so that moved from CPUs to more specialized GPUs. And GPUs took over the network and then it hit ahead and we went to uh, a, a chip, FPG, P, uh, FPGA chips for a short period, which is a bit more uh, advanced than a GPU. And then we took the leap to to ASIC chips, which are still used today. Is probably the, the last type of chip we'll <laughs> we'll be able to get for foreseeable future. And so, yeah, the, the network started at CPU mining back in the day, and there was relatively few people dedicating their their computing power to the network. Then, as it got fine and find these hashes, they got more specialized with GPUs and FPGAs, and then ASICs. And so, Bitcoin mining. Uh, revolves around these ASIC chips that do one thing, one thing only, and that is solve the hash cache SHA-256 algorithm that is looking for these hashes specific to Bitcoin. So what about like the companies that have now built it? Like that's a good explanation of how it's evolved, but like, you know, it's getting, it's heating up, right? You know, the price of Bitcoin has gone up and you've got public companies now. You've got this whole universe that's being built uh, around Bitcoin how did some of these, I mean, has it just been recent? What's like, how long have these companies been public that are mining? Is that like fairly recent or has it been uh, years now or what's, what's been going on there? I don't know if HUD 8 up in mining is the first publicly traded Bitcoin miner. Uh, they've been around since 2011. Okay. I don't know when they went public. They're on the Toronto stock exchange, I believe. Um, but yeah, it's been around for a while. Um, these, sort of professional operations um 
a lot. Well, that's the the other weird thing too is like it's pretty separated between these private miners, a lot of which just want to keep secret and be on the DL and just have these operations pretty significant uh, in a lot of, a lot of instances. And just mine Bitcoin, have nobody know who they are or what they're doing. Um, then you have these public miners. Uh, HUD eight was seeded by a chip producer called Bitfury. Um, and was basically a conduit to, to, uh, use Bitfury's chips while, um, yeah, we've had riot blockchain. They transitioned from a biomedical company to a, a blockchain company in like 2017, but they, they went through some troubles with the SEC, but actually running the ship and, and actually run like legit mining operations. Now marathon patent group has, has hopped onto the scene. Um, recently, uh, Bit Farms up in Canada is actually one of the largest public mining companies. I mean, it's, it's people riding the narrative wave in Bitcoin, hoping they can leverage the public capital markets to, to expand operations or play the narrative game for stock price as well. Uh, I, one thing I would say is not all public mining companies are equal. I don't yeah. even know how to mine Bitcoin that well. Right. Uh, I think, I think you, a lot of the private miners actually do. A lot better on the execution side than sure. the publics. Man, I could talk a lot about uh, that stuff, but I want to get into more kind of oil and gas. You're already at like 50 minutes, so uh, I want to kind of start getting more into like this oil and gas side of it. I mean, like the energy usage is high for Bitcoin mining, and if you think about it, and I have, uh, we've talked about it when we talked last time, but it's just it's getting to a place to where you start to think about okay, if you can control the energy, you know, at a base level, and not just they control the energy physically, but also the cost of that energy, then you're well positioned kind of long-term to be able to grow and to scale mining operations. And if you think about these on-grid miners and you and I talked about it, I keep going back to kind of this idea around the capital stack with, with mining, right? Cause you've got at the base level, you have to have the chips and the miners or whatever infrastructure around the miner. So for you guys, a shipping container for others, it may be a building or some type of, uh, structure and so that's kind of like probably your base level of capital needed and then you have your main input which is which is energy but if you think about the energy there's a lot of capital that's involved in for example grid energy so to get energy off of a grid you've got probably billions of dollars in the capital stack i mean it goes from the power lines substations it goes to the power plants you've got then the energy that's feeding that so whether that's you know fossil fuels renewables you know whatever it may be nuclear i mean there's this just billions and billions of dollars of capital between that miner and that energy to get it to that miner right and so the people that are doing this on grid it just it's a little counterintuitive maybe it can work you know i've actually heard oklahoma city have like heard from, I've been bringing up Bitcoin, a bunch of people, uh, and they're like, Hey, did you know that there's like a bunch of hidden mining, like all over the city? And apparently like Oklahoma city has got like a bunch of these miners everywhere because I guess energy costs were low here. And I talked to a buddy of mine who was an electrician and he was like, yeah, like we did it. We've done a bunch of work on these and they're like all over the city, like hidden in strip malls and hidden in like these different places. And I was just like, what? <laughs> Didn't know. But, uh, and so maybe that works short term. You go to a place where there's cheap energy costs and you can, uh, you can hide these miners places and, and, and set them up. But I mean, like long-term efficiency, it's like, you just want to be, I think at the basic level and maybe I'm missing something, but I think you just want to have as, as least amount of capital stack between you and the energy, right? Like you just want to be able to have like that base cost of capital, which is your miner and whatever you, you know, you contain it in temperature control, et cetera. And then if you could just have the energy right there, just going just kind of directly into the miner or into the Bitcoin, it seems like that would be long-term uh kind of the ideal setup i mean is that right yeah uh, like not even from a capital perspective just from a control tip, right I mean, that's one of the long-term bets we're taking in great american mining is we specifically target energy sources that are off grid because we don't ever want to compete with the grid or fall beholden to the political to the politics around around grid energy um Again, we think off-grid provides an opportunity driver cost of power production down significantly lower than, than a lot of the market, but also gives a troll the power generation, which gives us more security from a political risk perspective. There's been plenty of instances in certain areas of, of Bitcoin behind the grid 
riding like a, a good wave and then having to come in and just completely destroy and bork the the uh the pricing of of that power most famously up in quebec with hydro quebec had a, a crazy amount of excess energy on their uh, coming from one of their dams and Bitcoin miners were plugging in and at very cheap rates. And for some reason or another, the, the government in Quebec stepped in. It was like, ah, oh, you guys are taking advantage of us. Um, so we're going to raise tax on on Bitcoiners using this specific energy. And so it, it, those taxes raised the, uh, the, such a point where it wasn't profitable. And to mine Bitcoin, all those miners left. They went to other areas um, and had, had excess energy still there. So the dam's not making any money All right? because the, the government came in and messed it up. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, that's one of the problems. And then again, like uh, during PN, uh, depending on whether or not you're, you have a load balancing agreement with the uh, energy provider that you have a PPA with, like demand gets high for the market and they're willing to pay a higher price than you're profitable at like they'll they'll get the energy and you won't be able to mine um which is something especially with the competitive nature of the bitcoin mining landscape and uh, how quickly these a68 they're basically physical options on future bitcoin so you want them they able to, to produce that bitcoin if they're up and running producing hashes and so you want to make sure that been have as consistently and as possible and off grid if you can create reliable power generation in our opinion provides the best opportunity to do that yeah so like we talked about it a little bit on the gamcast but in my mind it keeps coming back to like the energy forecasted the forecasted energy needs for mining and i think it's you read a lot of stuff about it and somebody i read a tweet which that's probably not even true because I don't know how this works. They tried to like tie the price of Bitcoin to what they thought the energy needs would be, which maybe that's a way to think about it. I don't know, but they said something. And this was like an anti-Bitcoin uh, tweet. And they were, you know, talking bad about how the energy consumption. And they said something like, by the time if we ever got to like a million dollars of Bitcoin, that the energy consumption would be like twice that of the United States. Or they're throwing out just some, you know, uh, just crazy numbers. But do you have a sense for kind of like, is there somewhere out there just to get smart on what the energy consumption is today? And then like, is there a way to plot? Is there any way to forecast like what, the, what it will be into the future and say, look, here's where we're at now. Here's where we're going to be at in five years, 10, 20, or are there just too many variables to be able to predict kind of what the energy needs are going to be moving into the future? Yeah. I mean, there's many variables of take duration. I mean, I think Bitcoin will consume all the stranded energy at some point, um, and this is a good thing. Uh, we sh the more energy we use, the better society. I mean, that's been proven out with data, the history. Um, but there's like, again, that may pipe dream that probably won't happen in our lifetimes. But uh, you have to think of the nature of the chain for ASICs. Like right now, um, we had a downward difficulty adjustment last friday the we had the adjustment and it the the difficulty mine fell by one percent and uh it's a bitcoin up five to six x six months and yeah. the hash rates all gone up about 15 percent uh which is an abnormality uh in, throughout bitcoin's history like if it is up that that much and that quickly like you'd expect more individual plug miners in means or uh, can enter electricity uh but what we're coming to find is that there's constraints at the supply chain the the uh, ability to get uh onto the the foundry floors to lease space on the foundry floors to produce six that electric miner to produce hashes is like extremely competitive now and uh, like new batches of miners People are buying the last six maybe until the end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, and so the limiting factors on the amount of they'll be consumed at the at the chip level. Like you can only consume you can only consume uh, as much energy as the, the amount of ASICs on it would allow you to do at some point in time. 
So that's that's one factor to take into consideration. Um, and, and again, the price of Bitcoin too, like where it'll track that. Hopefully the supply issues get figured out back to tracking that somewhat. But yeah, Bitcoin's going to consume more now hey, because Bitcoin's going to a value to the world. The value, um, the consumption in line with the value. And again, purely the market cap driven system where it's they're running out of much energy as profit like that's where yeah. it goes to as soon as the energy costs go past a certain point on average and the the probability margins on producing bitcoins drops to a, a certain point like miners but like i think people look at it the wrong way like um how much bit how much is bitcoin quote unquote consuming when they shooting out like what type of energy are binners converting into electricity All right and what second and third order effects does the market producing demand for those stranded energy sources in society um over the short medium and long term i think when you when you flee the questioning and the narrative um to that it's actually extremely extremely bent for society it paints like an optimistic fu future for for bitcoin society at large because your tank and again have been typically stranded for for all of human history and you're you're getting it out of it for for all of society you're producing economic value that that raise production of society overall which is a good thing yeah definitely i mean it's 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 just interesting if you tie it into kind of i mean i tie i like to tie it in my mind to oil and gas but uh but you know there's obviously other sources of energy and i think that there are you know cheap uh energy that's not that's either being wasted <clears throat> like with what you guys are using uh, or just cheap energy out there that uh can be produced and that can create a product in Bitcoin that is, you know, good for people. And, and so it's just, uh, it's interesting. Like it would be cool to look at what maybe some forecasts would be uh, given some certain parameters, like, right. Like under this parameter, it could go to this, uh, et cetera. But I just think that it is going to be from the oil and gas side of the world, something that is being looked at more closely. I mean, it certainly got our attention uh, around what the possibilities could be and how does it take what may be, and out of favor asset that's, by the way, it's getting produced anyways. Uh, a lot of these things, whether that be flaring or whether it just be natural gas. I mean, there's areas like natural gas fields that, you know, you can look at it and say, this field is like the, you know, the natural gas. And a lot of times it's proximity, right? Like there's a lot of gas fields where the gas is far away from market. So it is getting, it has to go through all these pipelines, has to go through a processing plant, has to go on an even longer pipeline to go all the way to Chicago or to the Gulf or to wherever. And so because of that, back in the field, that gas is worth almost nothing. If you could take that gas out of those pipelines, because a lot of those, you know, that gas may be in contracts that are, you know, no longer valid that you can cancel those contracts. You could burn the gas or put the gas into a generator right there, convert it into Bitcoin for the network and, and for the, the greater good, for the reasons that you've mentioned on all your uh, platforms around the good that Bitcoin creates. And that's actually better for the environment. Number one, it's better economic proposition for the person that owns the energy. Number two, when you transport energy, specifically natural gas, along that value chain, you've got what we call LNU, which is lost and unaccounted for. And so these pipelines aren't infallible. They have gas that seeps out. You've got emissions along the way. You've got emissions for compressor stations. They've got to burn it. They've got to you know send it further. And so you're using this natural gas, which, by the way, is going to be produced anyways, so even I'm trying to think of scenarios even outside of just flaring. I'm talking about just gas that maybe just be getting a bad economic net back, which is what we call like what the price you're getting paid. Mm -hmm. And then you're getting it all the way to this market. And there's all this waste along the way, fuel, leakage, you know, there's just all these things. And then just to get it to this end user who, by the way, like whether we, whether that gas gets produced, that end user is still going to use gas. And so if you could repurpose that gas into uh, mining it for Bitcoin, you're getting a lot more efficient use out of that energy. And then you're creating the goods that we, uh, the good things for societies that you, that you mentioned around Bitcoin. And so, you know, what's interesting is like just the moralization of energy consumption. And we talked about this some on GAM, but it's like, 
why pick on certain things? You know, and I've heard you say, well, you know, the U.S. dollar, it's underpinned by the, you know, the military complex and we've got to protect our, you know, our sovereignty. And there's a lot of oil that gets burned with that. And that's maybe like an extreme example. It's a good thought experiment, I think. But I think there's even more like practical examples around uh, just like the stuff that we do. I mean, we, I think I mentioned it on the GAM thing, but it's like watching TV or, you know, a bunch of lights in a podcast studio or just whatever. But it seems to be that there are many, many things that energy is used for that is very wasteful, primarily in recreation that nobody ever talks about or cares about. But it's like, for some reason with Bitcoin, you guys are getting picked on. Uh, why is that Marty? Lights. Christmas lights, cruise ship, Christmas lights, <laughs> yeah. damn cruise ship and cruises it's all for heathens. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry if I trigger a lot of people there, but, um, yeah, no, cause I, so the Bitcoin gets picked on cause a lot of these stew, frankly, uh, a bit lazy pundits and journalists mainly and butthurt <laughs> either gold bugs or financial types that, that have missed the Bitcoin's price appreciating up to this. Real quick, gold. You mentioned gold. Just I don't want to sorry to interrupt you because it's but just gold. Talk about the energy usage of gold. People are always like Bitcoin, gold. You have to mine it. You have to transport yeah. it. Think about transporting some yeah. gold. You have to put it in huge trucks or planes and fly it around. Then you got to store it in what I'm assuming is temperature controlled buildings. Maybe it's not. Maybe they're non temperature control. I don't know how gold is stored, but I would assume that just the upkeep, the security around storing gold. I mean, you're talking about massive amounts of energy consumption for gold. No one ever talks about that. No, I mean, you're only talking about the storing and transport. How about the excavation? Which right. Forces people to de destroy environments and, and bring like mercury and, and kill mainly poor people in third world countries that, that are going to desperately excavate that gold on behalf of rich people in the West. Um, mainly the, at the excavation level, it's pretty bad for the environment. Like mining Bitcoin versus mining gold. The uh, footprint on the the actual physical earth is leaps and bounds different. It's, Bitcoin is extremely clean compared to to, to gold excavation. Uh, you just put miners in a shipping container and you're next to <laughs> uh, flare stacks that are now turned off because they're not flaring gas. They're not wasting gas anymore. They're using it to mine Bitcoin. Uh, going back to like why does Bitcoin get picked on? It, it, it stems from the stupid, like frankly. Like, and I don't want to sound harsh here, but it is legitimately like if you are still saying that, that Bitcoin energy consumption is bad because it provides no value to the world. So that's the crux of the argument that this energy consumption FUD stems from is Bitcoin. It's consuming all this energy. and It doesn't provide any value to the world. It's just plainly objectively not true. Like I would love for these these journalists typing at fucking skyscrapers in New York City, yeah. uh, sending their tweets about Bitcoin's energy consumption from their iPhones, uh, flying to exotic vacations in Miami and Tulum uh, twice a year to live that, that millennial wanderlust lifestyle. I would love for these assholes, these idiots, these nincompoops to go to Caracas, Venezuela and go to people who have had Bitcoin to them from family members abroad because that's the only way they could get money into the country uh, so that they could buy medical goods and food to survive. I would love for them to go to Nigeria, to go to Lagos and tell the women of the NSARS movement who had their bank accounts cut off by the Nigerian central banks and had to turn to Bitcoin because they literally were in the banking system because they were protesting women in the streets and uh, people around the world sent Bitcoin because that was the only way they could access money. I would love for these privileged assholes to go to Lagos and tell these women that Bitcoin hasn't provided them any value. I would love for them to go to Hong Kong, Belarus, and come to me and tell me Bitcoin hasn't provided me any value. It's provided me an extreme amount of value over the, the, the time I've been invested in it and using it as a savings vehicle. Yeah. But so the argument stems from something that is just objective loss, that Bitcoin provide value in the world it's only a speculative asset where this is just objectively not true right 
Well, and I mean, just, I mean, even not even Bitcoin, but if you, I mean, if you look at what Bitcoin is as a currency or as a, you know, a store value, a currency, whatever you want to call it, like look at human history and just how, you know, anytime there's access to banking or there's access to currency or there's access to trade where everybody has equal access to it, which is very rare. I mean, a lot of times it's the elites that can get access to these things. And you're talking about that right now. And some of these, uh, less, you know, countries that are, I don't really like the term third world country, but countries that are, don't have the same infrastructure that we have or systems. And so I think you can probably correlate and tie, you know, access to, uh, to banking or maybe banking is not the right word, but access to being able to trade and value via some type of currency throughout history is probably tied. I would guess to a lot of things, you know, certainly quality of life, uh, quality of business, being able to you know, create and grow and have businesses and to be able to have all these things, savings and all this stuff. And so as a whole, it's kind of like the energy arguments, right? Like around, oh, well, look at this energy production. It's so bad for the planet. It's like, well, look at all the good things that it does. So it's not just this, uh, you can make these blanket statements. It does, I mean, having access to 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 money and to the things that money, and I guess, I don't know, banking's the right word. I keep using banking, but maybe there's a better word for it. But just this, what's that? Yeah, that's the right word. Yeah, like so having access to banking, right? I mean, that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal uh, for people that, that don't have that right now. And I think it's a first world mindset around uh, this provides no good. Well, it's a, yeah, you can go over to an ATM and you can pull out money whenever you want, or you can go and open up a checking account and it's not that hard for you because you live here in the US or in the Western world. And so it's a, if you really start to look at the morality around what it can provide to people, I think it's pretty clear, but it seems like pretty lazy takes that are really just kind of like headline grabber, like click on my article type of takes, right? These aren't well thought out takes. Yeah. Takes delivered by idiots. So there's a man by the name of Matt Alborg. He has a, a website called usefultulips.org. If you go there, I would go to an article he wrote in February of 2019 called A Nuanced Analysis of Local Bitcoin's Data Suggests Bitcoin is work it, Working as Intended. And he basically created it because people about just the Wall Street bets types and Bitcoin bros in the Western world uh, speculating on the price, which is true. It's right. definitely going on. We're not, <laughs> not going to say that's not happening. It's happening. Uh, but they'll, they'll just say that's all that's happening. And this is objectively, again, not true. So Matt went and he created an index and he calls it the usage per online economic person index that basically measures the, the amount of people in a country, the GDP of that country and the internet access, uh, uh internet availability in that country. And based off this index, uh, the, the, the highest penetration of Bitcoin usage uh, taking into consideration all those factors are places like Venezuela, Colombia, Argentina, right. Nigeria, Russia, like all these places that are have despotic regime, terrible currencies are using Bitcoin as Satoshi intended. And that's one thing you mentioned. And that's another thing. These, these idiots focus on Bitcoin, the asset, the token. There's right. two aspects to Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the asset, and that runs on Bitcoin, the network, which is a, a network that is unlike any money transfer protocol that has existed up to this point in time. Again, it's a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system. People in Nigeria and Venezuela are able to access Bitcoin, the token, because they have Bitcoin, the monetary protocol, the network that allows people to send those tokens without a third party being in the middle. There's no sanctions that can stop people from getting access to the, th that capital. There's no intermediaries that can say, hey, Marty's trying to send Bitcoin to Max and they were talking about COVID on YouTube. We don't want them to be able to economically interact with each other. Like that can't happen. And that's yeah. like, so people focus on the token and the price of the token specifically, but the peer to peer network is, is what makes all, all of this possible. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, and we can, again, I don't know, we're here over an hour, but so, but I got a few things more that I want to cover here. We, you know, one thing that I would love for you to respond to, which is, these are the questions that I get. Uh, when I bring this up in the oil and gas space or in the energy space and, you know, people say like, uh, let's see here. I wrote down some of these, the most popular things, but like, for example, well, because this guy just created it out of thin air, like can't someone else just create another Bitcoin thing or like, you know, kind of like how they've done with all these other coins. Like what happens when Amazon creates a Bitcoin? Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but what was your response to that person when they say that? I mean, people have been trying for <laughs> decade now over a decade uh you can't like recreate bitcoin so like well let's go to the example central bank digital currency amazon 
example. You certainly try to <laughs> yeah. be competitor a bit. Never going to be able to compete. And again, going back when the it is peer to peer and distributed. Right. Like an Amazon or fake, it's going to be completely centralized. Feeds the Facebook purpose. and Amazon is going to be able to, Marty and Max were talking about it. Like they're not allowed to send our Amazon to right. Facebook. Same thing. Facebook, this is actually drives a lot of value in the because ring though and be like, hey, we need to fucking kill this guy to destroy the bit work. As soon as Berg announced more I think his own currency in the form of Libra, he was dragged in Congress and Davis and they were basically reprimanded. Well they can't do it. And it hasn't launched yet because they were figureheads that were dragged in front of the government and told, no, you can't do this. Satoshi being an anonymous individual that existed in four email list, like it was never possible him in and, and reprimand him for unleashing this revolutionary technology on the world. Not gonna be able to compete. And then when you think about other cryptocurrencies that are out there, like a lot of people say ETH's gonna flip in Bitcoin. Like I, I just don't think it's gonna happen. Coins network effectiveness, it's conservative development culture that makes sure that the network is distributed and most importantly, like small enough from a data perspective that in a individual blockchain verify everything for themselves. No other project in the space close to to the properties Bitcoin has attained and, and that the 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 regards of decentralism. And then affirmed we only get one shot at we only Bitcoin is our one and only shot creating a really scarce distributed asset in the digital age. It's real. Like if one competing currency the quote-unquote decentralized competitors, not even like the under the fee, like the Ethereum's, the Bitcoin world. For to ever like flip in Bitcoin and take or completely destroy the ability for there to ever be a digital asset, Bitcoin can get flipping. What's that from getting flipping? And once like you have one coin, it's this vision of new coins flipping Bitcoin, and the new new Bitcoin gets flipped as well, and you don't have the bull bull my system that Bitcoin's. Like, I don't think Bitcoin's ever replaced. It's hat. It is escape velocity, and all the news of the other currencies boys. Uh, they'll they'll game, but gonna replace Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, so. The escape velocity uh, comment that you just made, like, so to kind of end this thing or to get closer to the end, like talk about kind of the some of the macro and there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. Uh, I started listening to this stuff, to you talk about it and to some others and doing the research and reading a little bit about it. And had always, and had felt FOMO around Bitcoin for a while. I have a brother-in-law that made some really smart decisions with Bitcoin uh, not too long ago. And I think he's doing, I think it's a positive thing for him. Uh, I don't know all the details, but he's been in it now for a while. And I also, so it was funny because like, even like a year ago, kind of right before COVID hit, uh, I was talking about, you know, buying a couple Bitcoins. I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, throw some savings into this. And so you just get then like, you just watch it. And I think this is how a lot of people feel, right? And it's like, I know a lot of people that I talk to them about it and they're like, they want to get in. And they're like, ah, oh, but it's just, it's like, it keeps going up. And then I like, I'll just wait for it to dip back to like 20,000 or 10,000 of Bitcoin. And, and, uh, so finally I just was like, when I started, when I kind of, the macro part of it clicked around like what this could mean and where it could go, uh, I made a move in and kind of like, and have been buying some, I feel pretty positive about it. And I think I mentioned to you, like the last time we talked, I don't think it was in the podcast. Uh, I recorded like just, I had like a backup recording and I was like listening to it. And then afterwards I was like, yeah, man, I'm trying to get some, I was like, worried about my cost basis or something like that. And you're like, dude, your cost basis is great. Trust me. You're like, it's going to be fine. <laughs> and I was like, all right, you know, so, uh, but I mean, I guess at the macro level, there's a lot of positive stuff going on. And what's interesting to me when I think about the price of Bitcoin, because whether that's me investing in, in using it as a savings vehicle or whether it's like, you know, uh, if we ever, if I ever wanted to dabble or, you know, from the oil and gas side of it, get into the mining side or, or, you know, collaborate there, think about the macro and the price. And it's like, 
am I thinking about this wrong? Or is it really, it's just like demand. Like that's all that matters because like everything else, like oil or like natural gas or all these things, it's like, you've got all these supply and demand complexity, but for Bitcoin, it's, it's basically just demand. Like we know the supply. So really like you're just forecasting, like how many people want to use this and own this. And that's kind of it. I mean, am I thinking about that right? I think so. I mean, it's pretty, that's, that's the beauty of Bitcoin too. Like it's pretty simple. Actually, all this mining talk, the distributed system can make it seem like gibberish to some of your listeners, some of your viewers. Like at the end of the day, Bitcoin's value props are very, it's a distributed system. It can't, like it's hard to take down because it's defeated. There's only 20 Bitcoin that'll ever exist. It'll be on ads. A lot. Because you're following the rule and not trying to ways in, in the network and yeah like, all right how many people in the world could benefit from a scarce digital asset a scarce is that to be physical or and <laughs> when you start doing the math uh, yeah. everybody can uh, benefit from this and so that's like one meme in the bitcoin space is 21 million divided by infinity right like, bitcoin is going to suck in all all the store of value value that exists, all like real estate, art, gold, it's all gonna go into Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a better store of value over time. Not to say all the, the prices of those assets are zero, but their their store of value, um, the, the store of value part of their valuation is going to get sucked coin. Homes will be reduced to uh, the consumer goods that they should be. And the utility they provide is a consumer good, it can get. Uh, will be will, uh, gold bugs get really freaked out about this and they do not like it, but gold's going to be reduced to its industrial value um, and its aesthetic value. And you can add the aesthetic value to it as well. Um, it, the art world, like people will still pay for art, but you're not going to have people money laundering uh, via huge sales at Christie's and stuff like that. It's basically art is a huge tax evasion and money laundering game. Point. It's pretty overt. Like all that value is going to be sucked into Bitcoin and Bitcoin's binary. It's either worth zero dollars a market for the amount that the, the, all the value I just described in market and people will get hundreds of trillions of dollars. Right now we're at about a, a trillion dollar market cap. I think it'll be multiple hundreds of trillions of dollars. So when people say, oh, it's way too late. It's already at 54,000, whatever it's at today. Like, ah, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines, wait for it to dip. Don't do that. The best time to plant a tree was in Bitcoin's case 10 years ago. And the second best time is now. I believe that Bitcoin uh, provides utility to the world, which it does. And that more and more people to want to access the utility that Bitcoin provides. And due to the fact that it is a very scarce asset and people are bidding for that scarce asset, it will bid the price up. You, you get in. And what we like to say on Tales from the is just that stay humble and stack sats. Don't try to time the price. Don't try to uh, find markets or trade the markets. Just stay humble. Realize that Bitcoin exists. It's providing this utility to the world, and just make a game plan to stack Sats on a consistent basis. So dollar cost average in. If you believe in it and you have a big chunk of money, buy it, buy a chunk up front, and then continue stacking Sats as time goes on, and you'll find that that is very beneficial for for your net worth over time. If, Bitcoin is successful. It's going to be a lot more than $54,000 in the future. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, buying in, in terms of like, I'm understanding it more. And I think the understanding it more is helping me, you know, all these things that you talk about. And then that's why I wanted to mention it here. And so it's really just kind of this demand function around how many people want to own it and what are the, you know, how many people see the value in it. And I've seen some stuff thrown around, like where people try to approximate or use these, like, you know, Hey, look, if X amount of the endowments, uh, put Y amount of their holdings in Bitcoin and it's small amounts. Like if, if like all the pension funds and endowments put like 1% in, it would be a X trillion dollar market cap. And by the way, if each retail investor, but you know, and so it's like not that hard of math, right? You can just look at like 
if these people decided that, hey, this was worth 1% of my savings, and you extrapolated that out to some of these larger, you know, money management type of groups and to some of these in, even just individual investors, it's not like unfathomable. It's like very easily you can walk your way up to Bitcoin being worth a lot more. And so it's those types of things around, you know, if you're looking at a long-term, you know, belief system and why this is uh, a good place to store money, you can look to some pretty easy uh, calculations that show you that there's a real, uh, you know, path for it to be a lot higher in value. And then also you just, I mean, even more fundamental than that, just looking at all the good that it brings. And so kind of the last thing here to talk about what like future interesting applications uh, in the Bitcoin world, like will we ever have like a stock market that's traded uh, in Bitcoin? Will we ever have like, like what are like interesting things that you could say in five years from an application of how it's been used, how it could be used and the different you know avenues that can open up like will there be like lending based systems that are that people can you know raise capital or you know ipo a company or just those are just some things that i'm throwing out there but what are like the use cases that not only as just a store of value but beyond a store of value like the things that we can that this technology can do for society uh, just anything interesting uh, that you could throw out in that front so lending products exist bitcoin is super collateral is it they have high LTVs in the products, but that's just to pretend the price volatility that, that exists in Bitcoin. It's just inherent in the early stages of monetization process. So those exist. Um, I'm really excited. So like Bitcoin, again, it makes the offs to be be resilient. And one of which is it, it's not be a medium of exchange level. The protocol level is going to be a settlement layer where you settle large of transactions and in the medium of exchange um use case are going to be pushed to second and third layers and what i'm really excited about is the second and third layer that allow you to send small bitcoin extremely quickly and have final mint very cheaply compared to call level and so a lot of people don't know this but when built to the the the, the internet stack the tcp ip tp stack uh, the internet they had this native payment to the internet so like i'm sure you know the 404 error when you when you go to a page it yeah. doesn't have the, the the link that you're looking at they say hey error, this doesn't exist on the server um there's also a two error which is a payment that never get heard because there's nobody leveraging native payments technology on the internet bitcoin not until Bitcoin has that native payments layer been created or invented. So now we have payments that they can actually uh, fit it into the 402 uh, payment error part of the stack of the internet stack. And especially with the Lightning, so the Lightning Network is their solution. I'm most excited about. Uh, and just when you think about the possibilities there, endless. Like streaming sats, like something I about something I'm experimenting about with my podcast to crypt. Uh, so when I send my podcast to the world, I in my my R feed a Bitcoin address, a Lightning Network public address. It says, hey, here's public address. My RSS feed goes out to all the podcast apps. And they're going to market a few of these podcast apps that pick RSS feed a get my lightning pull it into the app. And as people listen to my cast app, they can say, hey, Marty, I love TC so much. I want to stream you sats per minute, which is like five tenths of a penny right now for every minute that I hear podcast. And so as in Zap right now, the Sphinx chat is the most popular. Uh, they listen and they just stream me Bitcoin at listen and they give me fractions of a penny, which has not been with any traditional payments process or if you ever PayPal, it's just impossible to send that small value uh, with the cost that it works. And you like start thinking about like, yeah. how that can affect the internet stack. Like instead of 15 bucks a month for Netflix, uh, you're only paying for Zoom. You only pay per minute and consumed. The efficiency in terms of consumption via streaming sats and these types of models, I think is going to be insane. I uh, create like a mean, uh, like payments network, like somebody create a pipe where 
uh, they went to a, the charging and they down uh, in their Tesla using the Tesla's computer and they paid per a lot hour like, minutely instead of just like charging and and paying whatever at, at the end um, they, they want hey I want to charge for five minutes I'm just going to stream you sat and Tesla's API allowed them to create that app so think about like the efficiencies that can be made in that area. It's insane. Um, and this, this is the only beginning. Like the, you can create a chat app, like the, the Sphinx chat app, which I was just earlier is also a chat. People hop into our podcast, try to the podcast. They chats. They could tip us while they're listening extra if they want to. And then at the same time, they can have a nation with us and, and the other freaks, the other people who are in the app. When they're like, when they're sending messages, Bitcoin, they're using the Lightning Network to send these messages. And so you robust distributed messaging protocols is what get us away from the censorship. Uh, Twitter, some of us will, will force on their, their, their use. Uh, Bitcoin is truly building a decentralized internet. Um, where the effects on society are, and capitation are going to be profound. It's awesome. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. Yeah, there you go. No, that's the stuff that gets me excited. And, uh, and the reason why I'm more of a believer, I just think that it's, you know, sometimes when you get these newer technologies, it's hard to wrap your head around the applications of where it can go just because you just haven't really thought through the implications of what it can do. And so, I love hearing about that stuff. And that's even more of a reason, uh, into the future. Cause that's another argument that you hear commonly made, which is like, you know, what, uh, it can't, you know, what are we going to use this for? And it's too volatile to be used as a currency. And so when you hear about the different possibilities of where the technology can go, uh, I think it starts to kind of open your eyes to, okay, there is a, you know, a broader use case that maybe even guys like you probably haven't even thought of everything. Right. Like, I think it's still pretty early. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> go ahead. It's it's extremely early. We can't even that's going to be. We were born at this flexion point. Like we were transitioning into the digital age. Like the internet, in conjunction with Bitcoin, is a technological shock to humanity, and the size of which is felt since the steam engine, arguably as far back as Google Press. Like it is changing. The inner humans interact the way we exchange value, and we are at the very, very tip of the of the. Going to be a transition that happens over a few centuries, and we just so happen to be born right at the beginning of it. But any of them, like if you told people, if you told Martin Luther, he was nailing the ninety five theses to the to the Charles, the church door, like the the, the amount of societal education that was from people's ability to read books for a century would lead mentions like the steam engine and flex energy you'd be like what the fuck is all that like, yeah like, like the same moving forward like we can't even fathom it yeah that's awesome well that's a good way to end this thing uh one thing i want to throw out is i've been trying to do more with uh energy content creators i've been uh, kicking around an idea kind of on twitter and some guys i know that or in the space, some guys you probably know, and we're trying to get together some type of like retreat where a bunch of energy content creators get together for like a weekend and do like content with it and just hang out. Uh, I don't know when it's going to be probably once this COVID stuff clears, maybe like in the summer, but there's the invite. You don't have to commit to anything. But I think like some of the, like the wildcatter guys and like Chuck Yates and some of these guys, I'm trying to round up like a bunch of kind of the content creators and just make like a fun, like content, uh, weekend where we just like record everything and just kind of hang out uh, and do the, cause I mean, just the energy stuff is so early with the content creation. And I just feel like when you look at like a barstool sports and all the interesting things and fun, like they're just having like a lot of fun, you know? And I just think that, uh, energy needs some more of that. So we're trying to plan something. Uh, I'll include you on the messaging. I don't know if you can break away. You got a little kid. I don't know how that goes, but, uh, it would be fun. We're trying to do more. Oh be good stuff the, uh, no again like i said to help you guys beam yeah <laughs> the uh the no the content game is right like and that's what we're doing barstool really thumb is like if you know your thing or you understand the conference fan the common gambler and 
speak to audience in a way in which they will and, and you do it consistently over time success and like that's like for so like i tried to apply that to the bitcoin space like i knew the audience was thirsting for specific with a certain sort of barstool not barstool till to a con, like a average joke, like a bar conversation right uh the subject yeah going up consistent and speaking to our audience and, and what they want has been what has led to the six, everything that I've built too, which is weird. Like, again, if you would have told me I was fucking unemployed for going on 18 months unemployed that three years from then I'd have a pretty, I'd be making more money than I ever did in my career via podcast ads. I would have told you to shut the phone on my leg, but it's the consistency and the ability to understand, the audience is looking for and how they want to be spoken to too it's right corporate bullshit like nobody wants that at the end of the day it's yeah like I, I, my skin because of the corporate world that's most people it's the yeah massive men lives of silent desperation true today too yeah for sure it's all good stuff no and i think that like the power behind it and the leverage behind it and for me i think you discovered it earlier in your career and that's awesome and i think it's your testament to like what it can do. And, and you look around and there's other people out there too. And it doesn't even have to be, uh, you know, at a high level, there's people having success with it. And that was what my brother like pushed me. He was like, dude, you're doing nothing when it comes to the internet or social. And he's like, and you've found some success in your, uh, career, but like, if you could amplify, uh, what, you know, it's like, and the thing that I noticed was that like, if I got, if I could get in front of somebody and I could, have the conversation with somebody or get to, if someone could get to know me and if I could get in front of them and talk to them, oftentimes that would be the biggest contributing factor to whether there was success in like what we were trying to pursue. So, and that was always hard, right? Cause it's like, what do you do? You go to like a dinner? Do you go to a lunch? Do you like call somebody up? Do you go and do you uh, go to a conference, right? And try to meet with people. And these are all like the traditional ways to to network. And I felt like, but what I felt like was that and I knew this intuitively, which is like just a little bit of effort when it came to those types of things I just mentioned, like just going to that conference and like palling around with somebody and like maybe grabbing a drink or going to do a dinner or something like that. What I, what I knew was that those things, oftentimes the ROI was like really high because you made kind of a relationship and you were like, man, that was, and so it was always in my mind, I got to do more, uh, networking. And then you break it down and you think about how much can you really do? Like if you were really aggressive and you called, you know, five people a day or went to how many, you can only do five lunches a week, right? There's only five lunches a week during the weekdays. Uh, how many conferences a year? Maybe you could go to one a month. That would be really intense. So it's like you start to look at some of these things and you tie it back to success. And it's, it was largely driven by, can I get in front of people? Can I meet people? Can I share the knowledge or the ideas? And then if you look at the content creation and what that the leverage and the multiplier effect around just being able to just to reach more people it's incredible and i'm just like just starting on it but and i don't know and uh i think that my bitcoin investments so far have already covered the cost of uh of all of this gear that i've bought <laughs> if anything uh, learning more about bitcoin i've uh uh getting in when i did it's already been a good roi just and that came from the podcast like meeting uh, you guys and some other people so I think it's, I think it's huge. I'm excited about it. It's uh, it's definitely a grind. I mean, there's an element of like, you got to keep putting it out there, but, um, but it's exciting to get to have these types of conversations and, uh, and to get to meet people. And so I'm glad that we got to do this. I'm glad I got to go on your deal and hopefully there's other things we can do in the future. We're going to, we're going to try the, the energy content creator thing. Uh, we'll throw that out there, but, uh, man, I appreciate it. And, uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank you for having me on. I can't wait for the energy content creator thing. I'm going to put together a, a memeing 101 presentation <laughs> while, while we're together for the weekend. Yeah, we, we, that would be good. We've been talking about doing it and then having the whole time where we do like on the office where you sit and you have those little like confessional interviews where we're like each talking or whatever. And then at the end, like splicing it all in uh, and then just doing a bunch of other funny, uh, trying to be funny and just do fun stuff. So uh, it should be good, man. But but hopefully, yeah, we'll talk soon, hopefully. And, uh, I, and uh, again, I appreciate you coming on.